Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Hollywood, and once again, I am joined by Imagine O's Pete. Hey, hey, hey. And Andrew Spanky Walker. Andrew Spank- Spanky? <laughs> Why am I Spanky? Because I'm wearing a hat. Oh, we're all wearing hats. That's what I just have happens when you don't pick it, the name. Is, is, is Spanky the one that looks like a young like baby Babe Ruth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was one of the few little rascals that uh, didn't get into trouble. Oh, uh, lucky him. Which uh, kind of tips our subject here that uh, today we're going to focus on the tragedy of child stars. It's an ongoing uh, issue since the dawn of filmmaking. Uh, One of the first child stars was an actor named Jackie Coogan. And some people might hear that name and go, it sounds familiar, but I don't know who it is. Well, he grew up to be Uncle Fester on the original Adams Family. Oh, wow. There we go. Um, But prior to that, he acted in uh, a Charlie Chaplin movie. He was in the Charlie Chaplin movie called The Kid, and he was the kid. And believe it or not, as a child actor, he was worth millions. Now, this is back during the Charlie Chaplin silent era. He was worth quite a bit of money. But... According to legend, uh, let's see, he earned three to four million dollars as a child actor. In 1938, uh, the kid came out in 1921, so this is quite a few years later. He sued his mother and stepfather when he discovered that they squandered all of his earnings. Uh, (laughs) When his mother was confronted and said, how do you explain yourself? She said, what? No promises were ever made to give Jackie anything. (laughs) <laughs> so they, she felt it was within her right to spend his earnings. Yeah, you spoiled little brat. <laughs> How yeah. dare you? You, you talented. <laughs> I probably work at 18 hours a day because there are no child labor laws, brat. Brought you into this world. I brought you out. Take you out of this world. <laughs> uh, that whole incident uh, cr- helped to create the uh, Child Actors Bill, yep. nicknamed the go. Coogan Act. Uh, after suing his parents of the money that remained, he received $126,000, but spent most of that during litigation. I read a story that he had approached Charlie Chaplin, who was still alive at the time. And Charlie Chaplin, without hesitation, gave him a thousand dollars cash, hoping that that was going to help him in some way. Um, but he, one of the first child stars had to deal with this, uh, thing that uh, created a, a law in itself to try and protect child stars. And uh, he passed away in March of 1984 at the age of 69. Um, so that was the, the, the birth of the child star and the problems that go along with child stars. Um, and we've heard just too many stories of uh, child stars gone wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's kind of a coincidence. We had planned on talking about this over the past several months, but by sheer coincidence, over the past month, we've lost two child stars uh, from the uh, the 80s and before, and both of them had fairly uh, troubled histories. Uh, Adam Rich, you know the name Adam Rich? Mm, that uh, doesn't sound familiar. Born in 1968, he played Nicholas on the TV series Eight is Enough. He was cast at eight years old, and the show ran from yeah. 77 to 81. He smoked pot for the first time at 14, dropped out of high school at age 17, almost overdosed on Valium in 1989, was arrested in 91 for uh, the burglary of a pharmacy. And this is kind of an odd twist. In 1996, he consented to a hoax uh, where a magazine published a story that he had been murdered and he signed off on it and said, you have my blessing. And people believe that Adam Rich had been murdered when it all turned out to be a hoax. Uh, He had been arrested for DUI. He was in and out of drug rehab. And just this month on January 7th, he passed away at the age of 54. 54 years old. That's younger than I am right now. Now, now, now going back to where he signed off on the death hoax, did, did, did you read any context like he thought it would be funny or he just was so bitter he didn't care and he wanted it to be true just so that I don't he could know. disappear? I would have to – I have, 
when I read that, I had to assume that money changed hands. Like that has oh. maybe someone said, "Hey, you know, we'll we'll pay you if you go along with this." I don't know. Only for the hope. Part. Yeah, was it was it like a like a trashy tabloid? Something that like was, that. Yeah. 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 Then, then they're gonna offer you, you know, two grand. You know? Yeah, it can't be to make his stuff more valuable because then you're faking <laughs> your death and the government gets yeah. involved. And... Yeah. So there was a troubled youth just passed away, uh, '80s child star, and then just recently Lisa Loring, who uh, was best known for playing Wednesday on the original Adams Family TV show. Yeah. Uh, she started acting on that series at six years old. She was born in 1958. Uh, her mother died at 34 of alcoholism. She was married the first of four times at the age of 15 oh. and had a child from that marriage that only lasted one year. That's disturbing in itself. Yep. Wow. And then in 1987, she married an adult film actor named Jerry Butler while working as a makeup artist and script writer on adult films. Um, so that's a little odd twist. She complained about him continuing to work in adult films. Uh, it's one of those deals where, like she knew what she was getting into when she married the guy, and then she tried to change them after getting married, and he was like, this is who I am. I, yeah, I'm a porn star. So they divorced in 1992. She, Like I said, she was married a total of four times, and due to her lifestyle and heavy smoking, she had a stroke uh, this month and passed away on January 28th. Uh, at the age of 64 and I saw her at the Hollywood show in April of 2022 and I did not recognize her. Uh, she was 64 when she passed away. When I saw her, she looked 84. Oh boy. Oh. She was gaunt. She looked sickly and I would have walked right past her table without knowing who she was if she didn't have signage on the table saying, Lisa Laurie, Wednesday from Adam's Family. You no, know, you, you talk about a coincidence uh, regarding Wednesday, and with the show that came out recently, Wednesday on Netflix. Yeah. It, because when she was, when she did a dance during the time when she's showing Lurch how to dance, and that dance, they made that a, a clip on Instagram and on oh, TikTok. Oh, sure. And it's become, because Jenna Ortega, who plays Wednesday now, pay, when she, there's a dance sequence in this, she pays a little homage to her by mimicking the move. Yeah. And so that's been making the rounds on the internet. And then this is before she passed away. And then once she passed away, now there are people like rest in peace. And uh, it's weird the univer the way the universe works. That you know this Wednesday Adams TV show takes off. It's very popular. It's it's generating these TikTok trends where these girls are dressing up like Wednesday, doing the dances and stuff like that. And then Lisa Loring passes away at the yeah. height of the popularity of the resurgence of this character. It's kind of odd. And, and not that she was a child actress, but Cindy Williams, who played Shirley on Laverne and Shirley, the anniversary of that show was just a few days ago, and she died right around the anniversary of the premiere of Laverne and Shirley. And, I'm, and whenever I see stuff like that, I'm like, wow, this universe has sick, cruel sense of humor. There's something about that town. I keep telling you that. There's something <laughs> about that town is with coincidences in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Now, continuing our, our conversation about child stars, a lot of people have heard that uh, there may have been a little rascal's curse. I hear people talking about it all the time. In reality, it, it's, it's hard to buy into the curse because 176 kids acted in 221 R gang shorts. That's what it was originally called before uh, when it appeared on television as Little Rascals. Uh, between 1922 and 1944. So of those 176 kids, there's only a few that are brought up as examples of the curse. And so I don't know if I would call it a curse of the little rascals. I just think that odds are child stars are going to go down the wrong path and people are going to se se selectively pick a couple of stories and, right. and add this curse uh, uh, blanket around it. Um, one name that always comes to mind when they talk about the Little Rascals curse is Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer. Alfalfa. Uh, he appeared in the Our Gang series from 1935 to 1940. I love this story. Uh, he was discovered by Hal Roach when little eight-year-old Alfalfa, or Carl, uh, his family, his mother, him, and his brother, I think it was, they were touring the Hal Roach studio. Like, uh, we would tour... Paramount or Warner Brothers right. today, 
They were touring the Hale Roach studio. Part of the tour included a lunch at the uh, at the cafeteria that they have, the commissary. When the mother, who I imagine being a typical stage mother, uh, prompted her children to perform in the cafeteria, as luck would have it, Hal Roach was eating at the cafeteria and saw little Carl Schweitzer singing off key and everyone laughing and immediately cast him to join the Our Gang uh, series, which I think is such a neat story. I what mean, a coincidence, what a huh? Hollywood story, you know? <laughs> come on, Joe. What a coincidence. <laughs> like, they, they happened to be visiting the, the thing that day, and then he says, she says, come on, kids, perform. He says, Hal coming. Hal's coming. Oh, yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and go. No. Uh, so that's that's kind of neat. Um, so he was, he was on uh, the Our Gang series from 1935 to 1940. There are stories of him being a troublemaker, a prankster, uh, just not. The kids really didn't like working with him. And part of it was jealousy because during his time, he kind of took over that series and, and almost outshined Spanky, uh, who was already acting before uh, Alfalfa came on board. Uh, of course, when the series ended, a typical story of just having a hard time finding work, being typecast. Uh, he had minor yeah. roles in movies, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, he had a small role in It's a Wonderful Life, uh, 1946 movie starring Jimmy Stewart. Uh, he was the teenager who opened the swimming pool up, which caused everyone to start falling in the swimming no pool. The, the teenager is Carl Schweitzer, little alfalfa uh, playing a teenager in It's a Wonderful Life. You learn something new every every day yes. on this podcast, don't you? Absolutely, yes. Mike. <laughs> At least twice twice a month. <laughs> now I'm going to be looking for it next Christmas. Exactly. You're going to be like, "There's Alfalfa." There he is. Also, I know several people who are huge fans of the the movie White Christmas, uh, which was a remake of Holiday Inn. Uh, there's a scene where somebody's trying to set some somebody up with their brother or something, and they pull out a black and white photo of Carl Schweitzer. So. He never acts in the film, but he's in a photo as the brother of one of the characters in the film. Uh, so that's kind of a neat little uh, uh, Easter egg in, in White Christmas. Uh, he also appeared on television throughout the 50s. When the acting thing wasn't quite working out, uh, he had side jobs. He bred and trained hunting dogs uh, with clients like Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, and Henry Fonda. In 1959, Schweitzer paid a $50 reward for the return of a lost hunting dog that actually belonged to an acquaintance of his named Bud Stilts. Uh, well, when the dog was returned, uh, Schweitzer had to uh, pay the reward, so he wanted to get it back from the guy who actually owned the hunting dog. So having a little too much to drink, Schweitzer and a friend went to Bud's house uh, to collect the $50. They got into an argument over the money, um, and at some point, Bud got struck in the head with a glass clock. Uh, he went back, retrieved a gun, and claims that it went off during the struggle, uh, almost hitting and killing their 14-year-old son, Tom, who was in the home at the time. Whoa. Uh, Bud claimed that Alfalfa threatened him with a knife, and still shot him in self-defense in the groin where he slumped to the floor and was dead on arrival uh, at the hospital. He shot Alf Alpha in the groin? In the <laughs> groin, and he bled out. And so the son... <laughs> now, this Such is something I... Of man law. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is something I just learned recently as I was researching this story. The son, who was almost shot, testified in court that Schweitzer never pulled a knife and was shot as he was leaving, and the the guy who pulled the trigger almost killed the friend that Alfalfa had come over with, <laughs> oh who had begged for his life, and then apparently the police uh, arrived on scene spare, uh, hey, saving the Hey, friend. no, turn him around. Get him in the balls. <laughs> oh, my God. It just, it's tragic, but we're trying so hard not to turn, like, oh. Yeah, it's a comedy of errors. And... Um, <laughs> And so that's the tragic ending of uh, the entertainer we know as Alfalfa. Uh, he's <laughs> buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. I've visited his grave. He has a tombstone uh, on the ground, and there's a, a hunting dog on it, which when I first saw the, the grave marker, I thought it was Petey, the dog from The Little Rascals. And someone corrected me and said, that's not Petey. He uh, 
bred and sold uh, hunting dogs. I was like, come on, that's Petey. I wanted to get a Sharpie and draw a little circle on his eyes. Right? Um, and so that's where he uh, is to this day. And uh, coincidentally, uh, he died on the same day, the exact same day as director Cecil B. DeMille, <laughs> who overshadowed Alfalfa's death. Yeah. So while Alfalfa <laughs> got you know a little mention on page two, Cecil B. DeMille <laughs> got the front page coverage, and so Alfalfa just sort of missed out on the tributes. I hate uh, to say it, for a guy that brought a lot of smiles and a lot of laughs, that's even in death, man, still entertaining people. It's a so, horrible way to go, but yeah. even in, I mean, I bet you if they put the details out, it probably at least have got to this page two. The yeah, details alone right. was worth the page two cup. <laughs> yeah, so sad ending. Uh, <laughs> Former child star life. Life. actor. Shot in the Shot. Ball. <laughs> Penis <laughs> blown up. <laughs> he was shot from behind too. So what? So they, so they went up like oh this. Oh my god! Pew! Yeah, I don't, I don't know the <laughs> details of recreating it, but um, but yeah, that's the interesting thing is the son said that um, his father did not have to kill him; that he was pretty much leaving. And uh, I guess when the gun accidentally went off, that was enough for Alfalfa and his buddy to say, "Okay, this is getting out of hand. Let's go." As he was leaving, the guy well, a gun, every gun will accidentally go off when you pull the trigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's one story trigger. that you know like, has led to the curse, like a Alec Baldwin. Oh, oh right, now, that's a whole other thing. We won't I didn't go there. Pull the though. trigger. Yeah, yeah. But talk that's, about, that's talk about some serious stuff, though. Talk about a future episode. Though. <laughs> no, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. Now another little rascal, and this kind of broke my heart when I learned about this a few years ago. I, are you guys our gang uh, little rascal fans? Did you grow up watching yeah, the shorts when I was younger, Saturday huh? morning or whatever? Tiny bit. There was tiny, a, tiny a bit. period. You know, the actors sort of came and went on the little rascals as they aged out. New kids came in, and some of the earlier ones that were on there was was Porky and Scotty, and uh, Scotty wore his baseball cap to the side, yeah. had like a, a sweater that was too big for him, was the most adorable, cute kid. And I remember watching them, uh, the two little buddies on Little Rascals, if, getting into if, trouble. To get a good visual on Google, uh, what should I type in for that original? Should I just put original R Gang 1920s? Uh, are you looking for Scotty? Like, type like, in, the, like the main, like uh, like the guys we've been talking about. Yeah, well, cast. look up Scotty Beckett, Little Rascals, and it'll it'll show you what he looked okay. like with his little crooked hat. So he appeared in the R Gang shorts from 34 to 30. Five, that was before Alfalfa came on board, so that's when Spanky was kind of little. Uh, and he uh, partnered up with a very young uh, Spanky. He continued to act in uh, after his R Gang stint, appearing with stars like Spencer Tracy, Errol Flynn, Greta Garbo, Cary Grant, and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, okay. But after that, his career began to go on the decline after 1950. Uh, he was fired from multiple jobs due to excessive drinking, a concealed weapons charge, and passing a bad check. Uh, he made lots of en enemies due to gambling debts and refusing to pay back loans. In 1957, he was arrested for trying to cross the Mexican border with uh, 250 stimulant pills. <laughs> in 1959, he crashed his car into a tree in L.A., which left him disabled. In 1968, he checked into a L.A. nursing home after suffering a serious beating, which uh, no one was able to determine who was behind this beating, and he never told anybody who was behind it. So it was probably a bad debt. debt, bad drug thing going bad. I don't know. But, Maybe it um, was uh, slappy. Uh, uh, spanky. Or spanky, <laughs> yeah, spanky. <laughs> slappy. Oh, man. A, what do you watch? <laughs> and so, so the cause of the beating was never revealed, and uh, after – Checking into this nursing home, two days later, he was found dead in his room. Uh, there were no pills uh, were found, but uh, and let's see. A note, uh, I guess it says, although, oh, it says, although pills and a note were found, the cause of death, with, death was never determined, although some speculate it was the pills and alcohol that killed him, and he's buried in Mission Hills, Los Angeles. So, again, you know, you, you, you watch these shorts, you see this cute little kid that has his whole future ahead of him, and it was just a, an endless trail of alcohol and drugs and trouble. And uh, it just seemed to follow him wherever he went and finally uh, took his life. Uh, Again, so that's that town. It feels like it, all that pressure because, yeah. you know, or you don't have a good support staff. Like, oh, yeah, try this drink, kid. Well, imagine yeah. being treated like royalty and being recognized everywhere you go while you're doing these shorts. And then 
you're almost forgotten, and I could imagine. And you're doing that as not a fully developed adult. Right. Yeah, exactly. It'd be different if us in our 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, if we got, you know, some sort of a claim and we made some money on something, you know, we would yeah. hopefully know how to process that. But that happened to, like, a precious, like, yeah, 10 that's... or 12-year-old kid who really maybe grew up in a bad environment and just wants to be seen. Hey, yeah. we'll give you whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, and when that's taken away, it's like you don't know how to function in society, you right. know? You have to learn how to function in society, and then if you're lucky enough to become an actor, you're more than likely going to survive this when it all is taken away from you. But yep. if it's all you know as a child and then it's taken away from you, you don't know how to function. Right. So my third Our Gang story, and this may surprise some people, uh, that there are a couple of Our Gang actors still alive today which is shocking Whoa. considering how long ago uh, that those were filmed and aired in theaters. Wow. One of those, our gang regulars, was uh, he was known on the series as Mickey. In real life, his name is Robert Blake. Oh, no. And R Robert Blake. As if this episode couldn't get dark enough. <laughs> Wow. He appeared, believe it or not, this is, uh, when I bring this up to people, they're like, get out of here. He appeared in 40 Our Gang shorts from 1939 to 1944 uh, when MGM took over the series. Uh, he had appeared in 23 episodes of the Red Rider film franchise as a child actor, which I did not know about. He ap appeared in a Laurel and Hardy short. The Big Noise. It's amazing to think that he is still around today. Yeah. Having acted in a Laurel and Hardy short in 1944, he had a role in Treasure of Sierra Madre with Hunt Humphrey Bogart in 1948, and he successfully transitioned into adult roles, most famously portraying Tony Beretta in the TV series Beretta, which aired 1975-1978. He had a white pet cockatoo named Fred and uh, a... a memorable theme song don't do the crime if you what? can't do the time that was sammy davis jr who sang this right. theme song uh so he he had a second Have career you seen that movie what's it oh i've never seen that tell what's lost the... that's david lynch's lost highway lost highway that's and right. i joe it is not your type of movie no no no, no. I it don't is think that. it's a, tr a true horror david lynch movie not all of his movies are horror but <laughs> right anyway um but yeah, the, to know that he was in such a weird movie, and then he was a little a couple, rascal. Uh, yeah, and then what happened? What six years after this movie came out, two thousand three. Yep, right. oh. and that's what this is all leading up to. <laughs> I know this is he called was, Hollywood Crime Scene. Yes. He was in the C Treasure of Sierra Madre. Now yeah, got to watch that again. When, right yeah, Blake? yeah, yeah. He's, uh, wait a second, is that Beretta? Are Are you yeah. uh, a David Lynch fan? Have, have you seen? I'm only in some of his movies, so I can't call myself a true fan. Yeah, I don't like those. Mahal uh, Drive. Those weird. I've seen Mahal Drive. Yeah, yeah. That that was actually I, I I watched that when I was entertained by that one. It was weird though. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't get into those weird right. movies. But <laughs> segueing uh, on May fourth, two thousand one, Robert Blake and his wife Bonnie Lee Bakley, who was uh, revealed to be a celebrity obsessed con artist who was determined to marry celebrity, didn't care who it was. I want to marry celebrity. She was just obsessed with it. Um, Ended up marrying uh, Robert Blake. They went to dinner at Vitello's Italian restaurant in Studio City, California. Their car was parked on a side street within walking distance from the restaurant. After dinner, they went to the car and he said, and this is so odd. This is such an odd twist of the story. He said, oh, wait here. I got to go back to the restaurant. I left my gun behind. So he leaves his wife sitting in the car, walks back to the restaurant to retrieve the gun he had left at the restaurant, which is so odd. When he comes back to the car where his wife had been sitting, he found her fatally shot in the head while sitting in the car. Uh, Blake was arrested, and it was claimed, and there, I guess there are several witnesses who say that uh, Blake hired a hitman to kill his wife. Uh, he was found not guilty during the criminal trial, but Bakley had uh, three children, I guess, from a previous marriage. They filed a civil suit against Blake in what? Now, this is very similar to what happened to O.J., right. uh, where O.J. was found not guilty criminally, but he was found, like, 
uh, civilly liable or whatever for the right. murders, which is I don't I'm not going to pretend to understand the legal system. Uh, so on November 18th, 2005, which was what four years later after the murder, uh, a jury found Blake responsible for the death and ordered him to pay 30 million dollars to Bakley's family. Uh, later, it was reduced to 15 million. Blake was destitute. He filed bankruptcy. And as of today, Robert Blake is still alive and will turn 90 years old this year in Whoa, September. Man. Ima- imagine being able to interview that guy. Like, Oh, I would love go, to go sit out with him and talk to go him. Out, go out to like wherever he lives and, and tell his you know, publicist or whatever, I, I'm not going to ask any personal questions and n- nothing about le- legalities. I just want to know his TV and film career and yeah, stories about that. Career, yeah. And, you know, sign a document saying, you know, I'm not going to, I'll avoid all the controversial stuff, but I want his stories, you know? Yeah. So, but like (laughs) I said, several witnesses came forward saying that he had solicited them to kill his wife. So more than likely, he made an arrangement, and let me say allegedly, um, allegedly he made an arrangement with somebody uh, and said, we're parked over here, I'm going to go back in the restaurant. You do what you gotta do. I but come my back excuses, out. My excuses when I when I when I leave her there, I'm gone back in to get my gun. Yeah, that was such a. I've heard of coat check, but gun <laughs> check at a restaurant. Yeah. That's a nice restaurant. But of it course, is. they they it's possible they tested the gun. They found out it wasn't the murder weapon, right. so that kind of saved them. But that was such an odd reason to go back to the restaurant to retrieve my gun. Um, so yeah, very strange story. That was a, a pretty successful Saturday. hit, man, because his his name is still unknown as yeah. far as I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> his identity is is protected. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so another tragic ending for a little rascal. Uh, some other little rascals who had hard times. Uh, Stymie Matthew Beard. Uh, he was a high school dropout, battled a heroin heroin addiction, and was in and out of prison. Died in 1981 at the age of 56 of a stroke and pneumonia. Darla Hood, uh, not that this is sorted in any way, but she contracted hepatitis while in the hospital, died in 1979 at the age of 47, far too young. Yikes. Uh, one of my favorite little rascals, Norman Cheney, who went by the nickname Chubby, or as he insisted, Miss Crabtree call him, Chubsy Ubsy, uh, <laughs> was 300 pounds yes. uh, in his youth. And lost 130 pounds but died in 1936 at the age of 18 so i think i think at 17 he was 300 pounds died at the age of 18 so uh and then i don't know if you guys remember froggy william laughlin froggy he had kind of this raspy voice he had glasses and uh sadly he was killed by a truck while delivering newspapers on his scooter in 1948 he was only 16 years old oh hit gosh. by a truck froggy frogger <laughs> you got wow. you over the game frogger you knew it was coming <laughs> you knew it was coming <laughs> oh man the memes i'm going to make on, on for when this comes out on the socials you guys are going to love it and then finally a footnote we mentioned pd earlier PD was poisoned in 1930. <laughs> so you look at all of those stories and you go, yeah, there had to have been a, a little rascal's curse. But then when you think that's only about 10 of the, you know, 176 kids. Yeah. Okay. So bad. I mean, law of averages, what do you think? And like, think about kids we went to high school with who are still in our memory. Uh, Out of 176 uh, kids, how many of them? I, I have a ten, have met you know I, I that's have a, already. I have, a, I have a ten percent threshold. At least ten percent have to have died under mysterious circumstances for. Oh, is speakers. that is that what it, that is Doctor Jones? I, 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 I have yeah. t- I have ten percent. If it's <laughs> not ten percent, I'm like, no, it's just bad luck. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, what what's the law of averages of exactly? You know, people meeting uh, death before eighteen, before thirty, right? Um, but right. but the way that these young people died, yeah, um, and. It's it's yeah. and, and I I laugh because it's so particular and not to of course demean them or anything it's it's very sad, right. but just but the the fact that we have the technology today and the information to be able to look at back at these things yeah. and you know analyze them kind of make fun of them in our own ways uh, but say hey this is the life don't 
it's not just don't the, get too I, close I, to the sun, Icarus. I think that the tech would have helped a lot, but I think it's the people stuff to prosecute. I mean, we have medical examiners. I mean, we were talking about uh, what was our first case with the producer. Yeah, the William Desmond yeah. Taylor. Yeah, and you know, he said, "Oh, he died of natural causes to turn the body over." You see gunshot wounds. <laughs> yeah. like, are you a medical examiner? Really? That's what you're gonna write <laughs> on that piece of paper. Yeah, I I didn't uh, consider that as a possibility. Yeah, he died of natural causes. That's a tiger's bite in his butt. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, like we said, the odds of a child star going down that wrong path is is pretty likely. There, it seems like. Less often we hear about a successful star who transitioned from a child star yeah. into adulthood. Some examples that come to mind, Shirley Temple went on to become a politician and, you know, a dignitary and uh, went from, you know, a cute little child star to a beautiful teenager. And she did uh, The Bachelor in the Bobby Sox with Cary Grant, I think it was. So she's like segued so seamlessly into adulthood. Elizabeth Taylor, beautiful child yeah. star. Beautiful teenage star to a beautiful adult, and so um, though she may have had her issues, she she seamlessly got into adulthood and, and right. continued to work. So those stories seem to be less frequent than the ones who uh, meet tragic ends. And so I'm going to turn it over to you guys because um, there are some more modern examples of of child stars who just for one reason or another went down the wrong path. So imagine those, Pete, what are some names that come to mind to you? Well, the one for me that really stood out, um, and everyone should has probably heard of the name, but River Phoenix. Yeah. For me, that was, I remember because I was, I was just entering teenagehood when, when I heard that uh, he had passed away. I think he died in like 1995, and so I was a teenager at that time. I was in high school. And it was it, 1993, and he was only 23, 23 sorry, years old. 23 years old, man. And it was, you know, that that for me, that made me confront the, the idea of mortality. Was you know, because I was a teenager, I was like, whoa, you can die at that age. I mean, that's that's so wild. Yeah. And uh, that club, the, uh, the Viper, Viper Room, was owned by Johnny Depp at yeah. the time. I think there were several celebrities oh, who yeah. owned it. It, it was their and, own little speakeasy. It, yeah. it was so exclusive because he bought that strictly for them. It was a place where only they would come to chill. Yeah. And he'd get the best bands to come and play there. Yeah. And so if you were anyone who's anyone, you could go. Maximum capacity was 200. Yeah. So he, he the, it was alleged that he could sit and he'd have a monitor and he could see who's coming in. He's like, let him in, let her in, don't let him in, don't yeah. let him. And so the could, story goes is that yeah. they were leaving for the night or whatever and stepped out onto the sidewalk in front of the club, and he collapsed on the sidewalk. I think his brother was there, Joaquin. Joaquin and Rain were there, and, his yeah. sister and, and brother. And uh, he died on that sidewalk. And kind of a sad footnote, um, upon my last few visits to L.A., the Viper Room was still there, but it is uh, slated for demolition from what I hear. They're going to build, gonna ask a, I think it's a, a, yeah. a apartment building or some sort of residential unit. Probably um, LA's which, booming uh, big time with Yeah, I mean, it was prime prop, it was it was a prime location uh, mm -hmm. right down there. Where, where where are those speakeasies today, Joe? Those uh, exclusive yeah. uh, If I knew, I'd be I'd yeah. be hanging out yeah. there, man. Yeah, those <laughs> like, I'm sure they still exist. Yeah, yeah. You just the getaways work, for the stars to not have to go to a, a club where you're going to be bothered and recognized. D don't worry, one of these one of these young celebs is going to mess up and probably tweet about it or put it on TikTok, <laughs> yeah. and th that's how people find out. But back then, they were, I mean, the, the paparazzi had to hunt you down. I mean, you can kind of see them coming in, but at least they knew they were safe once they got inside. They just put up with the, you know, I'd see Quentin Tarantino and Leo would come in and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, the saddest thing about the River Phoenix story is, is the yeah. potential that was yes. lost. Uh, he was a fine, fine actor. Uh, we talked about how he was in uh, the uh, Stand By Me, uh, Mosquito uh, Coast, Last Crusade. He Indiana. played a young Indiana Jones, and uh, to this day, one of the so brief, but he channeled Indiana Jones. He channeled yeah. Harrison Ford. I yeah, mean, mm -hmm. that was the only performance I've ever seen him in. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen him in anything else, but just that what nine minute intro or whatever. Yeah, it, uh, it was, he was it was great. Yeah, I, I when I saw that. For the first time when I was probably six or seven, I'm like, oh, I knew I knew this was in, a young Indiana Jones. Yeah. yeah, without him, even you know, I didn't even hear have to hear his name. It was you know, what was cool about that little sequence is like first we see what looks like an adult Indiana Jones yes. from behind, yep. and then it's revealed it's like who's this guy? Right, and then he's, it's revealed that he's 
gave the hat. young Indiana Jones mentor, and he got the look and the jacket and the hat and so the, the scar and the fear of snakes was all revealed during that little sequence at the beginning. It was ca- genius. The casting call for that guy was a guy who looks ninety. 90- Five percent like Harrison Ford. <laughs> yeah. yeah, almost like a, a television version yeah. of Indiana Jones. I mean, yeah. to this day, one of the best lines in there, he comes running out of that mine. He's like, "Mr. Matlock, you know, Hadlock," and he's like, "Everybody's lost but me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lost, lost but me. Yeah, I forgot about. That. It's it's great. It's just the way he, he and again tragically cut short. He apparently he started using drugs on the set of Stand by Me. You know, they, oh. they it was it was marijuana, but then it progressed to something later on. Yeah, and. Um, it got to the point where, in some of the stuff that that I've seen, and uh, and heard, that he would he would take crack and then heroin, and that those would be the things crack to get you up, and then heroin oh, to kind of like bring you down. Mm. And it was because he he cherished his anonymity. Apparently, one of his last the few words that he said before he died was, uh, "No, not the paparazzi. I want my anonymity." Oh. Hmm. I mean, wow. if that's one of your final words on this. You know, it's and. Hmm. It 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 you kind of see it because after he passed away, the paparazzi kept going. The, you know, uh, Joaquin Phoenix would talk about there were helicopters over their property, and there someone yeah. leaked pictures of of the from the casket. Oh uh, man, that's and brutal! People sneaking onto the grounds just to get pictures, and it's just you know when someone that's that part. I, I think that that feeds into the whole child star thing because that they, everyone wants something. You you you're the next big thing. Mm-hmm. And either they want to exploit you, or they want to be near you. Just it's a like great someone like uh, what was the lady who um, for Rob Blake? I mean, um, uh, Rob Blake just wanted to marry someone. Yeah, yeah, a celebrity. Be that connection to a celebrity. Yeah, yeah. you know. So River Phoenix, it, it's it's tragic, but again, drug. It's that pressure. He never wanted the attention, and so this was his way of escaping it. Mm. And uh, also the way he was brought up, he felt like he needed to take care of his his family. So, because I, I, the whole children of God thing that you know, Walking Phoenix talks about, but was that almost like a cult or something they, that they, they felt, were part of? They call it like I mean, they they don't want to call it a cult, but you know, if people call it a cult outside of it. You, you could see why they would, hmm. especially when you know the scandals that came out. They would use young women to go lure. Anyway, yeah. But uh, uh, River Phoenix, the way he did, he did the jobs because he was always trying to. Apparently, what he said was, "I I need to do one or two more movies, and then I can." my sister can go to college hmm. and he was good just then making music and then just kind of living the life. He never wanted yeah. to be in that. So it's kind of weird. Uh, and it's sad that that happened, but that seems to be a theme because, uh, another one of the stars that, um, that happened to is Dana Plato. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if people today remember a show called different strokes, oh, yeah. uh, but it was about, uh, a rich white man who, uh, adopts two black, of males uh, in high society, uh, you know, New York or whatever. He has the daughter played by Dana Plato. And sadly, over time, all three of those child actors ran into some form of trouble. And uh, Dana Plato, unfortunately, was was one of the worst as far as... Uh, well, go ahead. Talk about yeah, no, what I, she uh, dabbled I mean, in. On the, on the set... Uh, it became uh, that's where the drug use again started mm-hmm. for them. You know, it started with marijuana, but then it progressed to something else. And as the show went on, and as the pressure mounted, she ended up getting pregnant by a rock uh, by a, a rock musician, mm-hmm. and they couldn't write that into the show. So then she just left the show until she had the kid, and then she came back later. Mm-hmm. And I think you and I were talking about this off air that. They, she comes back in for the final episode of Different Strokes, and they said, "Oh, the reason she was gone because she was bulimic." Mm. They're like, "Well, where did that come from? <laughs> like, what kind of st- wow? That's a for a sitcom for a yeah. theme. They would just throw these like random heavy topics in. Like, whoa, you can't just like drop that bomb on people." Yeah, and and you know, we were talking about that. There's a, kind of a weird phenomenon when it came to like '70s and '80s sitcoms. Is you know, the family would gather around because you only had a couple of channels, and so you'd pick the show family would sit around we'd order a pizza we'd watch these comedies and all of a sudden the topic would get really dark yeah uh there's you know child molestation on, on different strokes there's an episode about a, a pedophile who was taking pictures of the boys shirtless and it's like you're sitting around with the family going what is this and yeah. that's an example right there like what and do you mean she was bulimic yeah, and you're like guys this is come on man this is <laughs> for the final episode too this is how you want to go out like this but with Dana Plato, what happened was 
you know, with the child star, you get typecast. She had trouble finding work after that because it was said, oh, yeah, you're the different strokes. Let's, let's try and cast you in roles like that. And so, uh, yeah, it, it became rough. And she ended up, her accountant embezzled money from her and, and fled. So mm. a lot of the money that she earned, she had lost. She had the, the drug abuse problems. Posed for Playboy at one point. Posed for Playboy, and it yeah. didn't work out as well, even though she got breast augmentation for it. She did mm. a couple of TV movies that, you know, uh, something called like Bikini Beach, and it didn't really work out. And then mm. she had, you know, she ended up going to Vegas and working in uh, odd jobs like retail and all that kind of stuff. But because the thing is, and I think we you'd mentioned this earlier in the, ep- in the episode, she didn't really have any skills because when you're a child star, you don't yeah. really get the chance to develop. And, and to do anything else, and uh, she actually could have been an Olympic skater. Hmm. That's what her mom was, her her, her adopted mom, was uh, talking about doing. It's like, you know, you can be an Olympic skater, figure skater, or you can do acting, and she chose acting. Yeah. But she didn't have any other skills. She got busted for, you know, breaking and entering. And, and, um, yeah, yeah. And then she ended up uh, having an overdose. Yeah, I remember when, when the news broke on that, it's, it's one of those deals where – it's sad, but it wasn't surprising. Like everyone kind of saw it coming. It was counting down like, you know, like some people might have what they call dead pools today. I'm sure she was probably on a few dead pools. Like it's just a matter of time. So when it finally did happen, I don't think people were surprised. She was going down that path. Right. It was really sad to, to watch and think, isn't there anyone in her life that can intervene and, and help her? And that's the thing where you see all these child stars where you just say if someone just gave us a little bit of guidance, you know, who, yep. you know, you Andrew, you were talking about if what if all of us <clears throat> got a claim, but we're in our 30s and 40s and 50, you know, yeah. it's like we'd have a better mindset, yeah. mo- more emotionally prepared, you know, like, hey, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> you know, the odds are at least uh, yeah. hopefully on our side. Yeah. But with these kids it, and it kind of goes into we were mentioning it off air. I think Dave Chappelle said the same thing. Like, he was. Older when the whole he's like, hey, I can't stand this anymore. I'm going to I'm going to Africa. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. yeah. When he saying, walked and, away from and, it. And all. people yeah. like he left. He just dropped fifty million on the table and yeah. left. Yeah. And and that was what 2003. Yeah. And he was he was he not he's even in his twenties. It wasn't even thirty. Yeah. Yeah. And he had accomplished that and he had had enough. Yeah. Because they they were working eighteen hours a day on Chappelle show. And you, mm-hmm. and then you can and, see you could feel that Hollywood yep. does that to you. It, it, they just yeah. keep coming on to you and then Only, and then well they'll take only what you'll put up with but and then you get out of the system and, right or you have to have a good support structure because like yeah. you said shirley temple mm-hmm. there's someone said listen i'm going to navigate this business i'm going to run this business not you you're yeah. not going to tell me i'm going to control my own fate and, and it's like you said a support group like let's say at a young age you do come into all this money if you have people around you saying look don't just blow it you know invest it put it away then you might emerge from this thing you know a, a healthy adult um but it, it each individual has a different mindset. And a perfect example is, is the Three Stooges. So you had Larry, Curly, and Moe. Larry and Curly spent the money as fast as the checks would come in. Uh, Larry was married to a woman who uh, didn't like to cook, didn't like to do housekeeping. So they lived in a hotel most of the time that they were doing the Three Stooges. So imagine the, the, the fees that are accumulated living in a hotel every right. day. Curly just, you know, couldn't spend the, the money fast enough on women and cars and stuff. Well, <laughs> Mo bought real estate and, like, invested his money. And so he kind of took care of Larry and, you know, those later years. So it, it depends on that individual yeah. where if you're going to spend it as quickly as you earn it and then all of a sudden it's gone, oh, my God, what's what's left? And so I guess it takes, you know, a certain individual to have the foresight or, like you said, a good support group if you're so young to say, all right, we're going to sock some of this money away. Yeah. A lot of it uh, today, you know, a young actor might have it put in a trust where they can get access to it when they're yep. 18 or 21 or something. So um, otherwise you're going to go down that path. And, uh, yeah, I get it. and it, it's that it's that pressure, it's that environment in, in, that, in that industry. And one of the ones that caught me recently uh, when we were doing this topic, uh, Judith Barcy. Yeah, now explain, because I did read about her, but when you mentioned her name, I didn't recognize it right away, but explain her story. Judith Barcy, for anyone that remembers, if anyone had, uh, who's a kid had enjoyed A Land Before Time, she was the voice of Ducky. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. 
I mean, I yeah. love that movie. And and uh, all dogs go to heaven. There's even a dedication to her. She was in Jaws for the Revenge, one of the worst moons in there. But she was the adorable little girl in there. She was in Fatal Attraction. She died when she was ten years old because oh. when she got into acting as a child, you know, she was adorable. So she got she did lots of commercials, and so she was making money. And her parents, uh, Joseph and Maria, uh, would basically be living off the money that she made. And her dad was an out al- became an alcoholic or was an alcoholic and just fed into his uh, his bless, bless you. you. And what happened was uh, by 1986, <laughs> so when she was eight again, uh, Sorry. you know she started to have um, show up. You know it's like hey, my d- dad throws you know stuff uh, throws stuff at throws stuff at me. I'm, I have bruises. And her manager was like, "Are you okay? What's going on?" And so she would manager would counsel Judith's mom. You need to get away from the husband. And in 1980, they'd filed for divorce, and they were trying to get an apartment and live separately. A couple of months after the first session with the with the therapist, uh, she was found. Uh, you know, Joseph shot her, shot Maria, b- bullet wounds to the head, doused their bodies in kerosene, but shot himself also. So they never burned the body. But mm. and it's just she was 10 years old. And I've never heard that story. That's yeah. awful. And it just you know at, at the time you know when I was doing this like oh my god like, yeah she's ducky and it's that voice and you think hmm. again because she was making money and it just and you talk about support staff and not having the right people around her and she said yeah. you know I wanted she was a kid she enjoyed she was having fun you know and she had, she had done those two animated movies she was and it's, it's just rough that's that that's the thing if you don't have the right people around you they they'll live off you yeah even if it's family. You know, it's bad enough you don't have the right people. Like, oh my! How many stories have you heard? My manager swindled me. My account oh, sure. swindled me. Yeah, you hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's heartbreaking. And you know, what we were talking about the the little rascals curse. There's also the the poltergeist curse, and uh, you know, Heather O'Rourke passed oh, yeah. away due to a misdiagnosed medical condition when she was young. Um, but the other girl in the the film, I, and I, I'm drawing a blank on her name. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, she was considered part of this curse because she was murdered by an abusive boyfriend and Jeez. she was in a relationship he was abusive people tried to get her out of it finally she had enough strength to step away from it and then he appeared outside her home wanted to talk yeah. you know oh i can be better blah 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 blah. so she's like i'm i'm gonna go talk to him went outside to talk to him he strangled her to death on the front lawn of their home and it's just so heartbreaking so heartbreaking and she was fairly fairly young when, when right. uh, this happened yeah. so um yeah the stories are endless you know one uh, bef- before we run out of time a, a couple of names that come to mind are, are the Corys. yeah uh, you know yeah. back in the 80s we had Corey Haim and Corey feldman uh both of them got into all kinds of trouble somehow Corey feldman uh continues to act and s- has somehow emerged from this but Corey Haim, who I always felt was the more talented of the two, he was in one of my favorite movies called Silver Bullet and did a bunch of movies yeah. in the 80s. He succumb, succumbed to the whole drug and Lost alcohol boys. thing, too. Yeah, yeah. And so one got caught up in it and didn't survive it. The other somehow emerged from it. Um, but, yeah, those two Corys were notorious for getting into trouble and having history with drugs and alcohol and that sort of stuff. So, Yeah. Andrew, any any other names you want to throw I, out? I was as just going to com- going to drop one name who uh, is I could I think is uh, a success story. Uh, good old Macaulay Culkin, yeah, Kevin McAllister. I had to go yeah, through. Let, his, you know let's do that. Let's end yeah. on a positive yeah. note. And, and and I can I can give my my own personal anecdote. The last time I saw him on screen, uh, so before Home Alone, which was his breakout, he was in Rocket Gibraltar. Have you ever? I don't think I saw that, but no. I heard. I did see him in, uh, was it Uncle Buck? Uncle Buck, Uncle yeah. Buck right after that. But look up Rocket Gibraltar. Look at that cast and think, why have I never saw that? <laughs> I saw that. Uh, it was on a Saturday morning special on Channel 20 or Channel 50 when I was a kid. And it was a good, like a good, uh, yeah, good movie. Uncle Buck, Jacob's Ladder, uh, which is like a drama. Yeah, of it's course, a heavy drama. Alone. The Good Son was that my girl? The good son? Yeah. Oh, my girl. girl. One of the good saddest yeah. on-screen deaths ever. I saw that in the theater. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Good Son, and the, which was like a, I guess, a horror Thriller, movie yeah. with he, uh, little uh, Elijah Wood. Yeah. Um, and then the Nutcracker. 
and then a couple of other ones. And then his last big movie was Richie Rich. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I never saw it. But after that, that's when he sort of dropped off. Uh, we all know he's been kind of public about uh, uh, drug abuse and uh, issues. He got arrested a couple times mm-hmm. and uh, has still chugged along. He's had some lesser-known bands on the side, uh, podcasts on the side. Here and there, he's shown up in films more often. And um, he uh, two or three years ago, he was on uh, Mark Marin and had a really good revealing uh, hmm. opening about his past. Yeah, he asked him about Michael Jackson, of course. And right. oh yeah, he did have that friendship. Yeah, he said that Michael Jackson was never inappropriate with him. Yeah. Right. So I mean that hmm. there's that. And then the last time I saw him was. On a show, I, I might have mentioned to you guys uh, just off uh, off camera. Uh, it's on HBO, uh, Righteous Gemstones. Yeah, with John Goodman, he uh, he was had, just has a two st- uh, two episode arc, and the character just because of how meek he is, like as a child, he plays the character as an adult. He doesn't talk much, but he does all the acting like with his face and in a hmm. chair, and it's but like he looked healthy. Yeah, and so and that was the last and he time. He still got it. I mean, does he still have? I I think so. Yeah. And Macaulay, if you hear this out there, we're rooting for you, buddy. I, you know, I am. I yeah. I, yeah. I want to see him succeed because, again, you know, he went through a period where it's like, oh no, he's going to be another one of these names typecast him. on the the wall of of tragic yeah. child stars who met you know tragic fates and. So I want him to do well. I want to see him succeed, and it's like you said, we're we're cheering for you, man. Right. I, his, <laughs> his his little brother has success. In yes, his, yeah. Kieran on the Succession. Succession. Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen Great the first uh, three seasons, and it's the fourth and final one's coming out. It's it's mm-hmm. it's he does a great job. It took me the longest time to realize that he was uh, in Home Alone. The guy who's the what's the bedwetters? Yeah. Uh, uh, Fuller. Fuller. Because he keeps drinking the Pepsi. <laughs> I, it took me for the longest time. I was like, yeah, he was in there. I was like, oh, I, no way. I somehow immediately knew they were brothers on screen when I saw it. Okay. For, for the first time. I just, I was that smart as a kid. What <laughs> can I say? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of some other child stars. I know one who went through a very awkward transition was, um, you guys are going to have to help me out on this, uh, is it Haley, uh, the uh, Sixth Sense uh, actor? Oh, yeah. Haley Joel Osment. Haley Joel oh, Osment. Yeah. yeah. So, he, he, man, one of the finest child performances in the history of film in that movie, The Sixth Sense. He followed that up with the uh, AI, AI, artificial AI. intelligence. He was in Forrest Gump. He was Forrest yeah. Gump's son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the little, yeah. yeah the little, that was before yeah. Sixth yeah. Six yeah, Sense. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And just six. a fine, fine actor. Yeah. And then he kind of disappeared off the radar. And I didn't see him again until I think it was an episode, or no, it was the the Entourage movie, uh, where there was a, a I want to say, a rich kid, an executive, something like that, who was jealous of Vince, and I was, I'm like, oh my god, that's Haley Joel Osment as an adult, and you know he didn't transition into adulthood as well as some child actors, but. I was so happy to see that he's he's getting work. He's still acting, right. and yeah. Can I add another quick personal anecdote about that guy? Yes. So you you guys have heard me talk, talk about one of my favorite podcasts, uh, Comedy Bang Bang. Uh, it's, it's like this, but you know the guests will have you know comedians, actors on, whatever, and they just screw around. So he, a couple of years ago, that the guest or the host uh, Scott Ackerman just randomly had him on because I think he was promoting an, an indie comedy movie mm. that he was acting in. And he was the most down to earth, funniest guy. Like that's great. Like go. he like he was in a room with like, you know, more a couple more people than us, and he commanded the room, and he was hilarious. So then, um, when they they still had the comedy Bang Bang TV show on IFC, and I can send you the clip, they gave him a backdoor uh, pilot episode that, of course, it wasn't really going to get made, where he was like uh, the goofy. Um, uh, cocktail maker on a love boat type show oh, like okay. from Isaac, the 70s yeah. <laughs> and I will send you that clip both of you guys that's later on because funny. it will show his chops he is so funny yeah, yeah. so see that's look, good that's, look, I look, want to look hear him that. up to see I, I, I think he's doing just like indie comedies now with uh, on TV or 
film, and yeah. he's he's really funny. I yeah. would love I would love for in the next decade to see him standing there with an Oscar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, and just, that that would be a re- nice... reunited with M Night. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Another uh, hey. one of the top <laughs> child star performances that I've ever seen, and I was actually I had the opportunity to tell him this to his face uh, is Henry Thomas, who was in E. T. Yeah. with a young Drew Barrymore. Now, oh, those are two child actors that easily could have gone a dark down right. a dark path. Oh, boy. Drew Barrymore had her demons yeah. uh, early in life as a preteen and teenager. Thank God that they were able to emerge from that. Uh, Drew Barrymore went on to become a, a, an enormous star and fine actress and now uh, has a daily talk show. Uh, Henry Thomas has appeared on like the what is it the Haunting of Hill House and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and uh, I got to meet. Well, I've met both of them. I met True Barrymore on the beach at Venice Beach, and I met Henry Thomas just a few years ago at the Motor City Comic Con, and got to tell him to his face that your performance in ET was one of the finest child actor performances in the history of film, and he seemed genuinely moved by that. He was like. Sure. Wow, thank that's, you, thank that's, you. Yeah, and and I'm so glad that they have emerged from that. Uh, what could have been a very dark path uh, to achieve success later in life. I'm really happy for those two. Yeah. Honor, honorable mention uh, recently passed, uh, even though she wasn't an actress, but um, of course uh, Lisa Lisa Marie Presley, daughter. Oh yeah, yeah. Elvis recently passed, and it, basically the same thing that took her father. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I guess a, a family heart condition, but mixed with uppers and downers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are for the, outside factors that yeah. kind of speed that along. And, and uh, he was what, 43, 44 when he died, and she was yeah. what, 54. Yeah. So just tragic. Yeah. Tragic. Yeah, definitely. Talented, beautiful people, Wait, but yeah. Elvis was how old when he died? He 40, was in his 40s. 43, yeah. 44. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was fairly young. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you thought he was older? I thought, well, yeah, yeah you know what? That lifestyle, like you said, <laughs> made him look. Well, that I, very I the last year or so of his life, he put on a lot of weight and had yeah. all kinds of health issues. Like his last big moment where he looked healthy was when he did the Aloha from Hawaii special that was seen by people all over the globe. Billions of people watch watched uh, his special, and that was like his last big moment. And right after that, he started to decline, and yeah. I was really sad to see as a, a fan growing up. I mean, I was. I don't think I was 11 yet when he passed away, but I was wow. such a huge fan. And uh, it's one of those moments where we all knew where we were that when the news broke that Elvis like had left the building. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we're... The a second co- Elvis has hit the South Tower. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Too soon. No. Oh, we're going to be getting the mail now. <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> On that note, Happy that, Black uh, History Month. <laughs> that'll give us a nice uh, hour-long podcast. And and this is a topic that we kept pushing back and pushing back, and I'm so glad we were finally yes, able to right. topic, uh, yes. touch it. Because that's such a typical Hollywood story, the, the child actor gone And it bad. is criminal. It's criminal what happens to them. Yeah. It's the, not just actual crime, but the, the situations. Yeah, yeah. But so What would we like to discuss in the future, gentlemen? Uh, topic sounds I good. think we have a list of topics that uh, we're going to address real soon. I know All right. some ideas that I have are like uh, on set deaths. You oh, mentioned yeah. Alec Baldwin earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah uh, uh, that's uh, a Brand- topic. Brandon Lee. Brandon yeah, Lee. exactly. Yeah. Uh, or stunt performers have died on set. That's a topic I'd like to touch on. And for anyone um, that wants to send mail, you can reach Andrew at PO Box one eight hundred F U. That's right. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, again, another great show. And I'm glad we're forward back. to our next one. And thank everybody for watching and listening at home. And uh, we'll see you soon uh, in a new season, new year. Of, That's right. Uh, Hollywood crime scene. Spanky out. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs>